He's an Elite Series champion, not just an Elite Series champion, but the youngest to ever win an Elite Series event. In the very same event, he waiting the biggest four days worth of smallmouth bass in the history of Bassmaster. Joining the Bassmaster Century Club and joining us here this week, Jay Shakurik on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all to the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. Um, happy Hump Day. I hope you're having a great week. And um, I thank you for coming back here week after week. I mean, you would think I'd think through these things before I hit record. I mean, I know I'm going to have to say something, but I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about um, the words that come out of my mouth. Um so, I appreciate you coming here, where you can always guarantee that I don't put any thought into this before uh, we go live. But a cool show this week, Jay Shakurit. Um, one of the questions that I got from a lot of people is, who the heck is Jay Shakurit? Because, I mean, he wedged himself right in the record books. He's only a seventh elite series event. And on this show, a lot of times we talk about those that overcome, those that, you know, they faced defeat before, and now they overcome it can't say anything like that about Jay Shakurit. He's had an incredible rookie season. I mean, before this event, he was having an incredible rookie season. Literally has led rookie of the year for the majority of the year. Two events left. And um, just in case you weren't paying attention to Jay Shakurit, he made you pay attention by um, doing something nobody in history has ever done. Um, and that is joining the Century Club with all smallmouth bass. We had two anglers do it, obviously. Him and Corey Johnston. Um, but Jay won 102 pounds and change and, uh, unbelievable. I mean, he is a generational lineal professional angler, his dad, an incredibly accomplished, uh, walleye pro and just a great family. I mean, that's what stood out for me. A great family down to earth, humble and, uh, obsessed with the sport of fishing. But a big question that I got last week at ICAST was who the heck is Jay Shakur at? And that's not an insult because, I mean, he's only been doing this for seven events. So we're going to try to figure it out on this week's podcast as I bring him in right now. Jay Shakurit, Bassmaster Elite Series Champion. How does that freaking sound? Sounds pretty amazing. If you ask me, if you told me that you're going to say that at the end of this year, I would have said no, no way, not a chance. It, it's... um. Your whole life. I mean, have you been like this your whole life? Like, have you been an early adapter? Like, I mean, it, it, like you've been on the Elite Series, regardless of what happened a couple of weeks ago in Lake Ontario. But, I mean, you were in 20th for Angler of the Year. I would say your rookie season's going well, would you not? Yeah, that was my my goal at the beginning of the year, regardless of what happened, was I just wanted to be, like, somewhere in contention for the Classic and then for Rookie of the Year whether I was in first or in sixth. Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to, like, be able to stay into the top half of the field was my goal at the beginning of the year. I saw you, last time I saw you was actually at ICAST. You were, like, the first person I ran into yeah. um, when I was trying to find out where to go. Um, and it was pretty cool for me to watch just the amount of people. Like, while we stood there for several minutes, you know, a bunch of people yeah. started coming <laughs> up to you. And then I didn't see you for the rest of the show because I'm sure you were busy. I was busy, whatever. I was only there for one day. How did ICAST go and how how different of an experience do you think the four days that were before <laughs> ICAST yeah. kind of led into that? Yeah, it was, uh, I don't know, crazy because just going back to last year, I mean, I was basically, I, I hate to put it like that, but like I was really just a nobody. Like I was someone that walked into ICAST and like, it was like, you know, like, who are you? Like, what are you doing here? Um, just a kid from Wisconsin. And just to have, just knowing like what kind of exposure I actually got just from the last tournament and the amount of like congratulations I got and just pictures and autographs. And like, I was pretty, uh, I was a little bit overwhelmed at first. And then once I finally got into the swing of things, like I just started talking to people and it was 
it was really cool. And it's something that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. Who was the most shocking and bizarre person that, that approached you to congratulate, or maybe not bizarre, but like, but they, you were like, Holy crap. Is that dude like, like, does he know who I am? Probably when I got congratulated by KVD in the strike King booth, <laughs> I was like, that was a little bit like, you know, like you see him all the time. I mean, obviously everybody's seen him and then all of a sudden he's like coming up to you to shake your hand. You're like, you're like, wow. Like KVD just shook my hand. Like that's pretty cool. <laughs> it, it, um, I joked about it on stage and I really do believe it. Like one of the best tournaments you can win. I mean, not only did you set a record to be the youngest to ever win an elite series event, not only did you set a record to be the, you know, first person or the heaviest weight ever weighed in, in a small and fast tournament. Um, you cracked a hundred pounds and you were going to freaking ICAST where you're supposed to make <laughs> deals. Do you, did you feel the deals were a little, I mean, and you don't have to get in specifics, but did you feel like, Hey, a week ago, this would have been a whole different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it was, it was like, basically when I talked to the people that I wanted to talk to at ICAST, um, you know, it was basically just meeting them, you know, talking about the tournament, nothing really business wise, basically just shaking their hand, getting their information. And then, you know, maybe later on, we can talk about it this fall when things rotate into next year. But yeah, it was basically just meeting the people and getting to know them and seeing, you know, the whole like family perspective around the, the company, basically seeing how they operate and um, where I'd like to put myself if I have that opportunity. How much of this knowledge and, and your knowledge in the sport of fishing comes from, I mean, you grew up with a professional angler. I, I got to believe yeah. that that gives you a huge advantage, not just like I kept waiting for little moments where I was like, oh, he's nervous now. And, and I didn't see my, <laughs> like literally the only time during the whole tournament where I saw you, where you kind of stopped was on the, and it, it might've been like, you might've been picking a kernel out of your back here to popcorn kernel from the night before. I don't know. I may be reading too much of this, but on the final takeoff, um, when I interviewed you, I kind of did this dramatic buildup of everything yeah, that's in that's front that. of you and, and look what's behind you. You know, you've got all mm. these records, all these opportunities, but behind you is the scariest cast of smallmouth anglers, you mm. know, maybe ever assembled. Um, and I saw you kind of, your jaw kind of got tight for a split second there, but yeah. then as soon as I turned on Bass Track, you had a four, four and a six in the boat. So I imagine any <laughs> jaw tightening loosened in a hurry then. Did I read yeah. that right? Yeah, you did. I was a little bit nervous. That was probably my most nervous point was before I took off the final day. Um, like you said, seeing all those guys behind you and like, you, you don't know how many times in your life you're going to have that opportunity, especially when you're leading a smallmouth tournament on the St. Lawrence by three pounds going into the final day. Like that's just a huge, I mean, any tournament in general, but a smallmouth tournament to have that kind of a lead is just so big. And like, yeah, my nerves were, were pretty riled up there at the final takeoff. But then once I took off, you know, I had a little bit of, I had a little bit of a breakdown, like taken out, like just on my own. And then once I finally got out to the mouth of the lake and got to my spot, then I was, I had my game face on and I was ready to, to finish it off. What does a little bit of a J secure breakdown look like? Because <laughs> I remember when right before you got the trophy, you said, I, you know, I might get emotional and, and I don't know that you did. <laughs> um, so, so like, were you, were tears running down your cheek? On the yeah, way there was or? a few. Yeah. Yeah. There was a few. I mean, it was just, all the emotions brought in from like, I got, I, I'll be honest. I had no sleep that week. Me and Alex were staying at a, like this house and it had zero AC and we got like no <laughs> sleep the whole week. And like, so like everything was just like crashing down on me at one time. And I, I mean, yeah, I shed a few tears on the way out and then, but I just don't, I just don't really show it in front of maybe the camera or other people, I guess I put it that way. So you do feel it though. You, you, oh like yeah. What did that moment on stage feel like? Because you, I mean, you know, you've seen the memes. People were like, you were pretty, yeah. <laughs> pretty flat, no, no matter up or down. Like, but, but I also think that that is one of the greatest talents a pro angler can have. Like to that ability to flatline and not, mm -hmm. I mean, it, you look at all the hall of famers in it, in 
fishing. I always use the example. The only dude that's an exception to that is Ike Canelli. He's the only dude that like <laughs> yeah. kind of spazzes out. Everybody else is very mellow. And, and, and I think that Ike in some ways is more mellow when he competes too. Like when he's actually fishing, um, what did that feel like when you were up there? Like, like all of those moments yeah. were, you know, like I'm expecting you to jump up in the air and freak out and everything. And you, are you jumping inside at that moment or are you just, yeah. kind of, and it was like, it's just, it's just a win. I am jumping inside in that moment, but like, it's basically that moment to me is like me watching all these elite series tournaments go back to when I was 12 years old, watching everybody win. And then it was like me up there. Like I was just like replaying that in my head, like over and over, like watching all these wins. And then like, all of a sudden, like I'm the one that's winning. And I'm like, I don't even feel like I'm the one that should be winning right now because like it was all like just happening so fast. And I'm like, I don't know. That's, that's basically what it, more, what I was feeling was like, just like rethinking like all the stuff I've watched in the past and like all these other people win. And now the people that were winning, were taking pictures of me on the stage. So it was like this whole like whirlwind, like Polinick was like doing this photo shoot while I was like holding up the trophy. And I'm like, what is going on right now? <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it's a weird little circle of life. And, and, yeah, and it's it funny because I was backstage with Paul Nick when it was all going down. And your dad said to Paul Nick right there, he's like, you know, when you when he was 13, we followed you around Green Bay, yeah. Wisconsin. <laughs> and and it wasn't until I was driving home that I put two and two together. It might have been like exactly 10 years on the dot, mm -hmm. because at the time, Paul Nick was 23. You were 13 yeah. following him around in Green Bay. That was the tournament right before I cast. It didn't work out good for Paul Nick. Johnny Van Dam <laughs> yeah. won it. But I remember saying to yeah. Johnny, you won. You won the best one, the one going into I cast. So literally 10 years later, I mean, it's it's your time. So I, I can't imagine that, that that wouldn't rock somebody. You know what I mean? Like just to be. Yeah, right. So I've. With all of this going on, do you think you've had a chance? Like it's been over a week now. You've been to ICAST. You've do you do you feel any different, or is it still like what the I'm living in a weird dream? <laughs> no, I I still. I mean, I don't change the way I act, like around anybody. Like I'm still the same person. Yeah. Like I still just talk with my buddies that I tournament fish with around here it's all the same. They're just like, Oh, like, congrats, man. Like, like I knew you, like my buddy before the tournament started my actual tournament partner. Um, he's like, he's like, you're going to win this tournament. And I'm like, I ain't going to win this tournament. Like whatever. Cause I told him I was on some decent fish and practice and whatnot. And I was like, so then, you know, getting home and getting able to talk to him about it and stuff like that. And it doesn't change the way I, the way I do things or the way I act or anything like that. It's just, it's just a pretty good opportunity. And I took advantage of it and on to the next tournament. When, when did you, when your, your buddy told you we're going to win from pre-fish, yeah. what, what, what moment in the tournament did you start to think, Hey, wait a second. It, if I do things right and everything goes, okay, I, I really got a really good shot of winning yeah. this event. It was after I caught that, uh, I think it was that one that was just over six and a half on day three. Uh, Cause when I, that day was a struggle for me. Like I started on my primary spot and it just wasn't going. I caught two good ones, like two, four and three quarters. And then I'm like, dang, like I can't get any more bites here. And I'm like, I need to go check on my other spot that I caught some good ones on yesterday. And that was even a little bit of a struggle too. I was having a hard time catching any size. And then all of a sudden I caught that one that was like, whatever it was six ten or whatever it was. And I'm like, when I caught that fish, I'm like, this is going to get me, give me a legit shot. Cause I knew at that point I had another, you know, dang near 25 pounds. And I was like, yeah, after I caught that one, I was like, wow, this is actually could, could happen. One of the coolest moments of the week for me, honestly, was, um, I got to spend, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes or so hanging out with your dad when he first got mm. there yeah. and to watch somebody who's accomplished as much as he has in the walleye world and literally watch him pace like so nervous. <laughs> and like, <laughs> he must've said to me 25 times, this is so much easier when you're the one actually doing the fishing. <laughs> um, what did it mean for you? Uh, first of all, but I mean, 
I know it was probably pretty special, but what did you guys say to each other when you like, I know he came to the end of the dock as soon as you kind of got in and yeah. uh, I wasn't there for that part, but what, what did he say to you? And what, what was that moment like for you? It's, it's a pretty special moment um, between us. We, we usually keep it pretty simple. Like as far as like text messages go and like, <laughs> like during the tournament and things like that. So like, it was basically him coming up to me and it was, he was like, you did it like, congrats, like you deserved it. And it was basically like four or five words. And <laughs> that was pretty much it. And that's usually how we keep everything whenever we're fishing tournaments or we're doing well. And uh, yeah, hearing that come out of his mouth uh, when I got back to the dock, that was pretty much everything. And then I had, um, two of his good buddies and my good friends, their family friends. And then my girlfriend came yeah. too. She made the whole all nighter trip with them, which I'm sure was terrible. <laughs> and then, yeah. It was, it was pretty Why surreal. would that be so terrible? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Three guys, one girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, did he give you any words of advice tonight before I wondered that? Like, I wondered, like, I mean, uh, it's your yeah, kid. So you feel like you should do something. He does. It's basically whatever was going to happen was going to happen is what he told me. He's like, if you're meant to win, you're going to win. And if you're not, well, you're not going to win. That's basically what he told me. And that's pretty much the words I've lived by for my entirety of the time I've been tournament fishing is if it's your time, you're going to win. If it's not, you're just not going to win. You said you had all those faces flashing through your head when you were on stage, people you've watched to win. Well, what one stood out to you? Like, but I mean, everybody's got their own personal man. That was the one that really motivated me. That's that's the spot I pretended yeah. to be part of. What one stood out for you in the past? Uh, I always look like I bring back the Brandon Polinick ones. Like when he won out there, when he was making that super long run, when he won after he got DQ'd from the cross, oh. because the lacrosse thing, like that's basically two hours from my house. So like I was always keeping up with that. And then when he went and won that tournament, I think I like rewatched that tournament like hundreds of times when I was a kid, just like watching him going out there, catching those big smallies. So like it had to have been that tournament because yeah, it's basically, I felt like it was like similar. Like I was making like, a, I don't know. It's just weird yeah. stuff. <laughs> I mean, that I think that that gets overshadowed as maybe one of the most iconic moments in our sport where it's like, if you really look at that moment and I did the interview, like, I mean, it was shattering an eight pound lead and got DQ'd yeah. from a tournament for doing something that anybody could have done. It was just kind of a weird, nobody even knew if he was right, yeah. you know, in the right area. Yeah. It's, it's, it was, you know, I, I wouldn't say it was anybody's fault, but he got DQ'd for that. And that mm -hmm. was the one year where he wasn't in contention for the classic and he, yeah. it was, it had to win and you're in. So I did an interview with him before he left. And the last question I asked him was you have one event left. Will you win it and make the best master <laughs> classic? And he looked, I mean, I've always, he looked right at the camera and said, I will win the next event and make the best <laughs> master classic, which if he didn't win, I mean, probably people would talk about all yeah. the time, but he did. I mean, he Babe Ruth his insane. shot basically. And, and so when people, when anglers say stuff like that, how can anglers also say stuff like when if, if it's my time, it's my time. Is that just something <laughs> yeah. anglers say to kind of take the onus off of them? You know yeah, what I mean? It is. It is because there's so many variables that could happen. Well, you know that. I mean, yeah. there's so many things that could happen, boats, motors, anything equipment there's just so many variables that go into it and then when it comes down you got a six pounder on it jumps three times you finally get it you know like within arm's length the boat breaks your line off just you know it's like there's just so many little things that go into it that if everything especially in the four-day deal because this is my first ever like four-day tournament i fished some uh i've fished three days but not four yeah. before so like that even increases all the things that can go wrong, like just the small things like that. And like everything has to go just absolutely perfect for you to win. It seems like. Yeah. And it, it's so often you see that a bunch of different times where, where anglers gets, I mean, look at the guy you beat. I mean, look at how many times yeah, he's oh been in God. contention yeah. and how many things have gone wrong. Yeah, and, exactly. Um, 
I mean, it's just, it's, do you think that, do you appreciate this as much as somebody that may have been around for five years and been that close? Is it possible for you to appreciate it as much, or is that something that will come with time? That's something that'll probably come with time. I mean, I think if, if I were it's an awesome answer, like, by the way, that's honesty. Yeah. <laughs> most people would be like, Oh no, I, it, it, it no, is it's something it is something that'll have to come with time because a guy that's been that close for, you know, three, four, five years in second place and hasn't sealed the deal on it yet. I mean, you can't take his perspective and look at it through his eyes because you haven't been there. So it's a lot different. I think. I want to talk to you about uh, wh- when was the moment in your household where, you know, you, you said to your dad, Hey, I like this pro fishing thing, but uh, <laughs> I don't like your species of choice. I'm going to leave the walleye world and focus on bass fishing. How old were you? And when did that happen? And, and was um, there actually a conversation like that? Or was he like, yeah, you're always been into bass fishing. Yeah. So there's never actually been a conversation like that because whenever, so actually like by the, when we started tournament fishing, whenever we would go like fishing for fun, we would always go for bass because my dad wanted to go for bass. And I was like, yeah, like, that's cool. Like, let's go for bass. And then, so every time we went out, like we'd never go for walleyes, we'd always go for bass. And I was like, started getting into the bass thing. And then that was also the time that, um, like the whole high school fishing and then like the clubs and the team tournaments started up around me because up here we didn't have hardly anything. And then all of a sudden it just started like clubs, team tournaments and all that. And then, uh, we fished like one local bass tournament we did pretty well in it. And I'm like, yeah, like this is, this is what I'm doing. It, um, and you had success in the opens too. I mean, early success, um, from the back of the boat. Was that all part of the plan? Like I'm going to go fish the open from the back of the boat and learn, or what was the thought process going into that? So that was, I got, I started fishing some team tournaments and then I got a call from one of my buddies, Adam Nye, who lives up in Sturgeon Bay. And he's like, Hey, I'm thinking about fishing the opens as a boater. Do you want to hook hook up as a cove? And I was like, well, heck yeah. Like we'll do the, who's going to do the one division or whatever. And, uh, yeah, so be it my first year, I ended up winning winning the last tournament on Grand Lake. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. And then the next year, I ended up winning another one, the last tournament on Lay Lake. So then I, at that point, I had enough um, funding to, I bought an 18-foot bass boat, and then I was going to fish the Opens as a boater that next year. And then everything fell into place somehow, and somehow I ended up at second points. And then I had to get ready for the elite series and yeah, it's all just happened so crazy fast and pretty insane. How do you win two from the back of the boat? I mean, I would think that like if if you, I mean, to win one from the back of the boat is amazing, but there's so much you're not in control of, you know, like you get yeah. the best approach um, and, and you're with the, dude that does not have the best approach. <laughs> um, so there's so many things that can mess with it. Um, does it shock you that you want to from the back of the boat? It does. It does a little bit not looking back on it now, because I've had, you know, several non-boater tournaments where there's like, there's no way, there's not a chance I could even come close to winning, you know, just based on what was happening in the tournament and what I was doing. Um, it basically just goes back to two days in each tournament that I had where I caught like a, outstanding bag for that body of water is basically what put me over the edge in the two co-angler tournaments on grand lake i think i had it was a three fish limit and i had like close to 12 pounds one of the days and then on lay lake it was in december and i had a bag that was another close to 12 pounds on three fish so it's basically those two big bags that like surged me over i think that's what what did it on the co-angler side did sponsors react to that? I'm always curious, like uh, the sponsors, when you win from the back of the boat, especially when you win a couple, do they start to think, well, maybe this kid's more than just a kid who I have yeah, trouble pronouncing his last name. <laughs> kind of. It's hard to speak to that. It was kind of up in the air still. Like you said, like, it was kind of like a yeah, co-angler. Like we don't really know for sure. Um, but no, striking lose is the one that they've, reached out to me after the co-angler deal. So I really enjoy working with those people over there. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, other than that, I didn't have a ton of, of sponsor 
deal, so to say, after the co-angler deal. So you started off this season as a dude who, who, um, I mean, I told you, I've told you, and I told you, Dad. I mean, uh, there's nobody's name I said more at my house <laughs> than than yours and Masayuki Masashita. Um, I would just walk around the house saying those two names because they're hard to pronounce. Well, you've gone from being a dude who had a name that's hard to pronounce to a dude who can walk through iCast, and I'm sure everybody knows how to say your name at this point. <laughs> is your leading rookie of the year? Is that even still a goal for you? I mean. I mean, I guess it's it a, is. everything's a goal, right? Yeah, I think I would like to make the classic more just because like I'm this close now and it would be my first one. And I've heard it's like the craziest thing ever. And plus, I think it would be cool because just to have like my family there and my girlfriend and that sort of thing. Um, and it's a little bit closer to home in the Knoxville area, so it's not super far. So, yeah, but both are still on my mind definitely and with good reason because i would imagine the bodies of water we're heading to are bodies of water that i mean didn't your dad win a big tournament yeah. on Hawaii? <laughs> he's won a couple of big tournaments out there so you spent some time in hawaii i have yeah i spent a little time out there i went and pre-practice this year a little bit and it was pretty uh it was pretty good for pre-practice so i'm excited to get back out there and See what happens. Do you think it's realistic? Some guys are throwing around the, and even before the hundred was cracked at the last one, I heard from a lot of people that, man, it could happen out of Wahi, which amazes me because it, it, it's pretty far north. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to happen out of Wahi. And I don't think it will, but I could be wrong. I, it's just a, it's just a different fish out there. And, uh, you know, like a five pounder on the St. Lawrence is, they don't have to be 22 inches long to get to that point. Whereas one on Oahe, they just don't have the same build out there yeah. in my opinion. But you know, then again, I mean, we're still going to see, see some big, some big bags brought in, but it depends. It all depends on that weather out there. Cause we were out there one day and it didn't say it was going to be windy until we got out on the water. And Oh man, it was pretty much destroyed your stuff when you got out there. Is big water your advantage? I would imagine growing up where you have. It's yeah. I mean, I'm used to it. I, I don't get scared of it or anything unless it's like, can't go out in and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, I know how to fish in it. I know how to work the boat in it and keep myself positioned where I can still catch fish in it. Um, somewhat advantage. I still don't like it. <laughs> it's not fun. No, but you're just, I mean, it's the beating you're used to, I guess. Right. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, pretty it's, much. <laughs> it, 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 you grew up around it. And yeah. then we're going to lacrosse, finishing off in lacrosse. And you already mm -hmm. said that's like two hours from your house. So I imagine you have a bit of experience there. A little bit, probably not as much as I would like to have, but uh, I fished some tournaments out there and I've had some success. So I'm excited to get over there. I think it all just depends on, uh, what the water level is going to be like when we get there and how that all plays out. It's always different every year. Last year I fished a uh, bass regional out there before I even knew I was qualified for the elites. It was the same time we're going to be there this year and the weights are mediocre. I think I, I finished somewhere around like seventh, which was good, but the weights were not good. I think I had maybe 12 pounds a day. So we'll see what happens over there. How do you think, um, lacrosse will respond to the polka music because all year long yeah. i have been excited to see they better they better bring it is all yeah, i'm gonna say better, yeah. um because there's a lot of places where it hasn't worked but i believe <laughs> that lacrosse wisconsin it will work in a big way and it i also think work. the classic will be awesome too i mean to yeah. get to the classic we need polka music in the classic <laughs> where, where did the polka music come from and why did you choose that that came from my big polish heritage from my grandparents. Uh, it was always every Sunday morning, the polkas were always on in the house or on in the car, either on the way to church or in the house when, you know, you were having breakfast and that sort of thing. And then also my grandpa played in a polka band too. So he's got countless CDs and all kinds of stuff. And it was always wow. just a huge thing. Like every Sunday morning you had it on the radio. 
I didn't know anyone listened to polka music recreationally. I like I just didn't know that people were like, oh, let's put on this one. I thought it was, I mean, I know people drink to it and dance to it and do all sorts of things to it, but I just didn't realize that people are, but I mean, hey, polka's cool. I mean, sure. Is it what it has has it what do people say to you about the polka music? Oh, they love it around here. I mean. People know it exactly when it comes on. They're like, oh, yeah, it's Sunday morning, typical 101.9. Everybody's got it playing on the radio. 101.9, that's the Polka Channel. Yeah, or that or 106.5. There's two. Oh, I'll have to remember those for when I'm in that part <laughs> of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm all for it. I, I love it. I mean, it... it um, I just, I'm excited to see how people, they better bring it. It's all I'm going to say. Right, Lacrosse yeah, right. normally does bring it, but they better, I mean, I don't know what I'm expecting. If people are going to start showing up and what are the, is it Lederhosen's? Is that what they're called? Is that? Oh God, they're going to have, yeah, they'll probably have, ooh, it could be pretty crazy. I don't know <laughs> what's going to happen. So to be blunt, there's a lot of people in the world, in the fishing world that, have asked me this exact question. Who the heck is Jay Shakur at? I mean, you, you own one of the longest a record that everybody has flirted with for so long. You now own that. You now own the youngest angler to win an elite series event, but long before the elite series, how would you explain yourself? You know, like what, what kind of person are you? What are you into? What, you know, what is your history? Yeah. I mean, I'm just a person that, uh, you know, I went to uh, school for marketing I went to a tech school for two years and basically my entire life revolved around uh, fishing, not generally tournament fishing in general. I just started getting into like the higher, higher ups when I was like 18. But when I was like a young kid, it would be like my mom would drop me off on the bank and like leave me for half the day. And I would just try and catch anything I could. Like my favorite fish for the longest time was like Northern Pike. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I was not really like an outgoing person. Um, I was pretty shy, like when I was younger, just not really talkative. All I wanted to do was go down to the bank and fish or whatever I could catch and come home. Sometimes I'd come home with a couple walleyes to clean up and stuff like that. Um, and then I finally started getting more into like the tournament scene and things like that. Like my whole life was basically hunting with my dad and family when we could in the fall, bow hunting and gun hunting. And then it would transition over into fishing and I'd spend time with family, go to school. And then uh, just a couple of years ago, I recently got a girlfriend. So now it's like basically between family, girlfriend and like straight up fishing. Like I basically do nothing else. Uh, My life basically revolves around fishing. I mean, I love to do it. I do it every day if I could. Like I live and breathe it. Um, and I feel like you almost have to if you want to, you know, do it in this industry. Like you can't like not downplay it for a couple of seconds because I feel like you're, you're probably going to end up getting beat by somebody that does like do it more than you do. It's without a shadow of a doubt. That's the number one key. Like and it doesn't matter whether it's TV, whether it's tournament fishing, whether it's running a magazine, writing, what, whatever you need to be obsessed yeah. with it to, or else, I mean, especially the life you guys live, the amount of time you're on the road. And like you mm-hmm. said, you're, you're competing in achieving all these great accolades, but you're staying in a place that doesn't have air conditioning. You can't sleep all night. <laughs> um, it's, it's not that glamorous at certain times, but if you no. love it, it's, it's everything. I mean, it's the, yeah. it's the, it's the greatest thing there is. And I think that's what makes our group of anglers and all the top level anglers so unique because we get it. You know what I mean? Like at one time you used to have to explain to people what fishing does for you, but now you're with a group of dudes who is like, I get it. You know, I Mm might've been more boisterous than you or louder than you, but we all (laughs) know that feeling. Does it seem weird to you that like, at one time fishing was something you did to get away from people because you were shy and it made you happy. And now oh, it's yeah. now, man, yeah. now it is the reason yeah. that people want you to talk into a computer screen yeah. a bunch. I can definitely see the, uh, the transition there. Cause it, before it was like, I just wanted to go out on my own 
like catch a couple bass and that was pretty much it and now it's like i go catch a couple bass and like i they want me to do three interviews and i was like wait what (laughs) it's cool though do you enjoy this part of it i do i do i like talking to people because it's all the people that are part of the fishing industry and like i love talking to people that like know the industry and like want to talk about this like because i don't want to talk about like the other stuff like this is what i want to talk about pretty much like what what's the other stuff like <laughs> li- other parts of life that aren't yeah part like parts of life that i don't really care about like politics and all that stuff oh yeah imagine that i'd be so angry if that was what i yeah, talked I just, about all the time oh god yeah <laughs> so was this the greatest achievement personally for you like in your life up to this point do you think I would say so. Yeah. I mean, with everything coming together and then like now all of a sudden it was just like, bang, like it just all happened last week. Um, the record and the blue trophy and all that. I mean, that was always my number one goal was to win a lead series tournament and it actually happened. So I would have to say, yes, it was probably my, my biggest achievement so far. So what's your number one goal now? Oh, <laughs> Uh, finish out the season, make the classic and rookie of the year is my next number one goal. Just looking at this year. Is that how you always set goals? Do you set goals? Are you a goal setter? I mean, some people write everything down and say five years, 10 years. Are are you that kind of person? Or are you like a year at a time type person? I'm a year at a time. Yeah. Like I'll like after this year's done, then I'll set my goal for next year. And then I don't, I don't like to do it like a couple of years down the road because you don't know what's going to happen. And yeah, I like, like the current, like day to day goals. You folk, I've always thought if you focus on yearly goals, the long-term goals will take care of themselves. As long as your goals yeah. are right, your yearly goals are right. Uh, you're focused on that. And yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it takes care of itself. Um, were you, your elite series career looks like it's, you know, it's been fairly simple for you. Like not, not to downgrade it, but like on paper, it looks like, man, things are going good for this guy. Mm-hmm. Did you have any moments this year where you were like intimidated or, or that were d- different than what you had imagined? Oh, for sure. Like what, for instance, when I went to uh, Lake Fork this year and like everything I found on the place was like, I I had some decent areas found and then that wind blew and everything that I had pretty much was trashed. And then like you look over and like see a Lee Livesey running around and it's like, like you can't tell me you're a little bit intimidated. Like when he's got all these (laughs) spots he's running to and you're like just out there like, yeah, like most of the stuff I found is trash. So now I just have to go find stuff on the fly. And I was like, man, like, like this could not end up. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of intimidation factor when it, I mean, when things are going right, they're going right and you can't change that. But when they're not going right and like you start seeing other guys out there that you know are doing good and like they got spots they can go to and fish and catch fish, uh, the intimidation factor was definitely there at a few tournaments this year. What is it like being an Elite Series rookie? Like, do, do you feel like you're, and it, previous to even this victory, but like, what well, do you feel like, it's easy to get accepted. Do you feel like the rookies kind of interact with each other more than anything or, or or like, what's it really like to be an elite series rookie? Um, definitely the rookies talk to each other more than I think, you know, some of the, the older guys on the elite series, but like most of the guys are super nice and like, we don't necessarily talk, you know, like during practice or any time, like during that time. But like once, we come into like the weigh-in tanks after a day of fishing or something like I've met a bunch of people and they're just super nice when you come up to the tanks and you talk about fishing from the day and like they're not scared to say like what they've been doing what they've been catching um it's really not as intimidating as maybe I I made it out to be coming into the year because in in reality I mean they're just normal people too trying to catch the same fish that you're catching just on a bigger platform so I try and look at it from some of the team tournaments I fish back home, 
coming in the same way, like you're going to get beat by the same guys that you're really realistically going to get getting beat by on the elites. I mean, they're just good and they're just good fishermen, but they're just people at the end of the day. Exactly right. I mean, that that's the right way to think about it. Does a lot of that thought process come from your growing up? I mean, just, just being surrounded by the who's who yeah. of professional angling. Um, I, I think that just that realism that there's a lot of people who come to the elite series and never had the kind of exposure you had to top level pro anglers on any level. Um, but you've seen, you know, the highs, the lows and everything in between. Um, do you think that helped you be better prepared for this career? Definitely. Cause I got to see like my dad come home, like from the highest to highs, like when he won the championship or won the AOI, and the walleye side and then i got to see him come home and the lowest of lows like not cashing checks um stuff like that like it just gets you more prepared for like what what happens when you do win like because i see that whole side of things like when he comes home with the big trophy and like he has all the phone calls that he does and then when he doesn't come home and he doesn't make any money like i see that same side of that so i think it prepared me enough to the point where I could at least handle it on my own um, when stuff like that did happen. You and Alex Redwine room together. Have you guys known each other for a long time or was this just a, Hey, no. we're rookies. Let's room together. Yeah. I like, I just hit him up on Instagram. I was like, Hey, like, do you want to split costs and run around whatever? And he's like, yeah, sure. Like, let's do it. And then, so we got it together at the St. John's and, We've been buddies ever since. We talk to each other every day now. And yeah. He was pretty nervous for you. Like uh, during that interaction yeah. with your dad, he was there with your girlfriend and everything. And, <laughs> and, and he, he was pacing. But I, I just feel like anybody, once they get it, I mean, you can't, you guys are going to look back at this year for the rest of your life, no matter what happens with either oh, of your yeah. careers. You'll always be like, yeah, in my first year in the elites, this is where I room with you. You might still be rooming with them 10 years from yeah. now. But um, it was cool to see that because you do see a lot of roommates who are like, yeah, so-and-so is catching him again. Big deal. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it was cool to see how supportive he was. Do you guys work yeah. together at all? We have. So we'll work together. So, like, we take different approaches at each tournament. Um, like, for the smallmouth one, we were both catching him really good in practice. So we didn't share spots with each other. We just shared, like, depth ranges, baits, structure all that sort of thing, kind of some zones of like where we were fishing in just so we weren't bumping into each other and things like that. But, uh, no, but like at a Pickwick, we, uh, we basically fished boat to boat next to each other, the entire tournament, which looking back on it probably wasn't the best thing to do, but we, we did all right. We did okay. And we found what we could find and it was okay. <laughs> I, I'd say you've done okay. I mean, you've done pretty good. <laughs> you didn't do any collegiate fishing, though, did you? Like you, you I didn't, you, no. If I look at Rookie of the Year, the two guys chasing you down right now. Yeah. <laughs> Bouts and Cody Hoff. I mean, this is a prime example of the two different routes. I mean, you can... Mm -hmm. the, do you regret that in some ways? Or are you just happy with... I mean, I, I don't want to lead. They haven't, yeah. so I guess you can't. But um, I don't regret it now. Um I don't regret it just because I, I think I I learned more than what I would have learned on my own going through the co-angler ranks because I, I drew some really good anglers in the co-angler ranks and I think I learned. I also got to practice with um, Adam who I fished, you know, the opens with or traveled with. So I got to practice with him and then fish um, potentially three days with boaters in the open. So, yeah, I mean, looking back on it, it's hard to say, but I did like the calling their side of things. So obviously there's big changes happening in that world. And yeah. <laughs> uh, what's your take on those changes? Do you, do you, because I mean, I'm amazed number one, that Bass is a big corporation, just no different than any yeah. other company. They do things um, to make money, just like a lot of companies, mm -hmm. this whole nine anglers taking the best nine, is not something they're doing for money. I mean, to be honest, no. like if, when you look at it from the outside, it's like they would have just left everything the same. If it was just money, they literally did that because they want the right people to make the elite series yeah. because you've seen a lot of people make it through three events and not everybody yeah. has the year you had. They're not, and, right. and it's not like they're 
It's not like they would never be ready, but they get thrown to the wolves and spit out and may never yeah. be back. So um, it amazes me that there's that much negativity about it. But but what is your take on it? Like, I mean, because you oh. went through the other route. Yeah, I can see both sides. So I can see the three tournaments qualifying through. Like, that's everybody's easiest route to get through. And I understand why people are so upset because of – like take for instance my situation like go back to last year like i there's no way i would have fished online just because of my situation um how young i was you know i wouldn't have had the funding for online obviously um so i can see people's perspective that way missing the three tournaments way through, through what i qualified for because obviously there are people that are plenty good enough to fish all three and qualify for the elite series but then i can also see the other side of it we're fishing all nine. Now you're putting more sh shoes to fill basically in a sponsor world because you're basically now you're more of an advantage to sponsors going to them saying, I'm going to fish all nine of these tournaments. So you're more of a help to them. So you could possibly get more money from them because you're more exposure fishing all nine tournaments. So, I mean, I could see both ways. You could get, you know, more funding through fishing all nine, things like that. But then you'd also have to sacrifice, you know, the job side of things. And then, I mean, it goes back and forth. I can see both people's ways on it. I don't really have one for sure take on it right now. Um, I mean, yeah, would, that, would I like to see them maybe change it up a little bit more than what they did? Probably. But looking at it now, I mean, we'll see how it shakes out. Yeah, it, it uh, I, I'm very interested to see how it shakes up myself just because, yeah. I, I mean, I, I feel like, um, I feel like what they're trying to do is the right thing for the anglers. Like it's for, right. for and, yeah. and yes, it takes away a guy who's going to fish three. He's always got that outside shot of I can make the elites, mm -hmm. but it, I mean, it's a pro sport. It ain't easy yeah. anywhere. Like it's no. never going like what other pro sport can you play three events and be like, I'm there. Uh, you know right. what I mean? And, and yeah. I know people throw out the U S open bull crap. That is not how the U S open works. Yeah. The U S open. Um, I mean, you look at the pros that, uh, I mean, Justin Lucas's brother is a professional golfer. He's been in the U S open, I believe <laughs> once or twice, and he's a pro golfer. Yeah. So it's not just like you can enter any tournament and get right. there. Um, so I just feel like I feel like it'll be interesting. But here's the weird thing: you don't hear any of those guys trying to make the elites, like the the hardcore, you know, the ninety guys that are fishing all nine of them. I haven't heard one of them come to me and be like, "This is wrong. This is like they all love it. Right? And they're all in for it. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, hard to say. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it, it is hard to say. But here's not some questions that aren't hard to say. What's your favorite movie all time? I always get asked this question. I never oh. watch movies. <laughs> you don't watch movies at all? No. no. What, what? Swear to God. Yeah. Really? Wow. So yeah. what What do you do when you're not fishing? <laughs> fish. You just fish. <laughs> no. <laughs> so no movies. Okay. What about music? Do you listen to music? Yeah, I do. I go back and forth. So I do country and then like when I want to get like a little more like energetic, I'll do like the hip hop rap, you know, like the, the stuff that's trending. Uh-huh. Yeah. Is there any poker rap? I feel like, <laughs> I feel like the world needs some poker rap. <laughs> no poker rap. That's only on Sundays at eight when you're tired and the pokers come on and then they get you going. All right. All right. Do, do you, what do you do? Like if you can't fish next Sunday, Next Sunday, you're off. Next Saturday, next Sunday, weekend. Got a weekend off. You can't fish. What are you doing on that weekend? Like, you, you can do anything that you want to do. What are you doing? Um, probably playing in the boat, uh, getting stuff. I like to, like, tinker in the boat a lot just to get stuff organized <laughs> and, like, exactly the way I want it. And then what else? Yeah, like or yeah, a lot of organizing, and then in between that, like when the girlfriend gets off of work, then we'll do something together, whether it's go to dinner, go hang out by the river, or just go out on the river for fun. 
what do you do on the river if you can't fish? Like, just hang out in the river? Just hang out on the sandbar. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Sa- is the sandbar like a party sandbar? Uh, some of them are. There's like different sandbars. Like <laughs> Which one, one do you, you know, go to? The party <laughs> one or the non party one? <laughs> uh, usually the non party one. It depends really? on. Yeah. Well, it depends on like the weekend or the weekday, you know, it's different every time you go out on the river. Well, let's say you like set a record and, and <laughs> waited the most small month in the history of mankind and won an elite series tournament younger than anybody in the history of the elite series. Would you maybe not bring the trophy and party on a sandbar then? No? <laughs> bring the trophy. Yeah. Only if I had other friends out there, sometimes when I go out there, I don't know half the people that are out there. So depends, you know, I got you. I got you. It, uh, you're a peculiar little creature. I, I find it amazing, but I, but it also <laughs> makes me think you're going to have a bright future because you're literally obsessed with this. Like unless, and that's what it takes. I mean, that that's, you know, like you're not the only person that I've said, oh, what's your favorite movie to? And they pause because <laughs> pro anglers seem to just be focused on, how to catch the next fish. What's the greatest fish you've ever caught? Like, do you have a moment, a fish that you caught where you look back and they say, man, that was the coolest fish catch of my life. Yeah. So it wasn't the one I caught, but I feel like I was part of it. Cause I was like 10 years old. Uh, my dad caught, it was a six and a quarter pound large mouth on our home stretch of river. in like my first big tournament, we fished together and like I netted it and I missed it with the net the first time. And he was pissed. <laughs> and then it like got like it got like wrapped around this log and then it like finally came up and then I like ended up ending it and it was like the biggest largemouth anyone's ever seen on our stretch of river and like that was the coolest fish catch I think I've ever had. Um I didn't even catch it, but it was still the coolest because he was fishing for like a three pounder on a bed and his line was wrapped around this branch that was like three feet in front of the one that was on the bed, and all of a sudden his line like started swimming off. And he set the hook and it was a six pound female that we couldn't even see. And uh, yeah, that was crazy. That's a cool story. Is that when 10 years old, is that when tournaments started for you? About 10, it was like 11. I think when we fished our first like legit tournament together. So is there a weird bit of pressure on you? Like trying to make a living as a professional angler when you're dead? Like, you know what I mean? Like I've always looked at other yeah, people. I can see that when you have that kind of lineage, it opens doors. There's people who are like, yeah, I know mm-hmm. his dad or I know. Yeah. But it also must put some more pressure on, you know? Oh, it does. I did right away for sure. Like my first, that first tournament on the St. John's, like, I'll be honest, like I was a wreck. Like it was, I mean, that was pretty serious stuff. I mean, I would, I think, but I still think I was more nervous for uh, the last open I the last open when I qualified for the elites because there was so much like built up anticipation of that event. Like I was in second points and I didn't know like how many more opportunities that I was going to get to qualify for the elites. Cause I knew I was going to take it if I got it. And uh, yeah. So like, yeah, I could see how you could see that just a little bit of uh, nervousness trying to follow in his footsteps, I guess you could say. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you look at all the, the lineal people that have come along and, I, and there's many more coming. Yeah. Um, but, but I've always looked at that and I'm like, demand the doors might open quicker, but you better, you know, you don't get that time to grow. It feels like, and I mean, some people didn't need that time to grow because you're seven events into your elite series career and you're already an elite series champion. Um, it's pretty amazing what you've accomplished. Uh, what, what, record do you think will last longer the biggest smallmouth bag ever weighed in or you being the youngest ever win an elite series event um the smallmouth bag because we got really yeah we got some oh man there's guys that are younger than me right now that are past me guaranteed they know i mean their skill level right now like the young anglers is incredible and i think you're gonna see you're going to see guys getting into the elite series at like 20, 21 years old here in the next couple of years. It's getting to be, it's getting almost out of hand to the point where like, there's some kids that are just, yeah, they're almost unstoppable. It seems like. 
Wow. See, I would have went the other direction. I, I would have thought that <laughs> um, the age record, just because, I mean, I mean, Casey Ashley's had it for a long time. And, yeah, and then, had it for a long time. And then you've got it now. And I get it. But, man, you're, I mean, you were just, how long? You were 23, like, by what, a month or something like that? Like, how old are you right 23 now? 23 and, like, what was it? 23 and under a month, like 20 some days. That's pretty young. I mean, to, to, <laughs> to make it to you, I mean, it, it's going to be tough to beat that, I think. But, but I mean, yeah. I, I hope you hold on to both those records for uh, Thanks. quite some time. Do you, did, do you even think about those records or is it just a victory? Uh, to me, it's just a victory, I think. Just because I look at it. I, I do think I like the young, the young one was actually a goal of mine too, was like, I kind of had it in the back of my head when I thought I could win. I was like, man, like, would I actually be the youngest one to ever win one? And then one guy told me and I was like, wow. But like, I don't look at the the hundred pound one as much just because I don't know. I feel like if we had four t- day tournaments, like around us, like that, that record would be broken like multiple times. It's just different. It when? might be different. <laughs> like I'm willing to spring. debate this with you. In the spring, in what in May? Yeah. You, guess what the weights would be on Lake Ontario in May? Yeah, right. I mean, you, can't, every, you know what's good in May? Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. On, <laughs> no, but I mean, yeah, I know it isn't that's great. That's why I take, yeah, that's why I take that. I guess that's why it's different is because it was in July. and But obviously, we had the perfect weather and all that deal. But, um yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. I don't know. I don't know. It's all just such a <laughs> crazy time. There's weird things that happen with your tournament, too, like the bait you won on. Um, yeah. Drew, have you talked to Zona about that? He texted me, and he was like, you know that I was the one that uh, like came up with the bait, and I was like, no way. And then he's like, yeah, like one time when I was out on Ontario, he had a – I think it was a rodent or some yeah. beaver style bait laying in the bottom of the boat and he didn't have any more plastic. So he cut the rodent in half and used it as a drop shot. And that's how it was called the half shell. And I was like, what? <laughs> and <laughs> like, it was like less than a mile from where you won the tournament. Like that's a, like where that, that actually is, happened. It's yeah, that's pretty That's Yeah. That's weird. <laughs> it, it's, it's, I love those weird kind of things though. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it, it, um, it's pretty cool that how that all worked together. And, um, it's, it's pretty cool that you're a Bassmaster yeah. elite series pro at the beginning of the year. You were like, I don't know if I can make it, but I'm sure going to try. <laughs> and I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to be around here for a while. Um, Thanks. who was the most intimidating pro this year for you? Like who was the guy that you saw across the parking lot? And we're like, Oh boy. That's a tough one. Probably, I have to go back to like one of the tournaments where it was a local. Probably like Lee Livesey at Lake Fork. Because it's intimidating. Like, yeah, yeah, you're coming into that tournament like, like take my money, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, I felt like that. I mean, it's it's the same way. Like when you come. To, I was almost just as intimidated when I came to uh, St. Lawrence with the Johnstons, like because they fished the Sturgeon Bay deal with us, and it's like take my money, pretty much. I mean, they've been there four times, or they've been there whatever it was, seven times, and won three or four or whatever it was. Like that's just insane for them, you know, to come over there. They're not even from there. Yeah. They, they do that. They're kind of good at that yeah. stuff. Um, how popular did that? I mean, how many texts did you get from friends, not from winning, but just from what you said on stage when you said <laughs> they've been coming, and taken from us. So I decided to take from them. I thought, well, that won't make the Johnsons happy, but there is a bunch of people in Wisconsin, like just freaking. Yes. Oh, he said yeah. it. There was all the Surgeon Bay locals that messaged me were like, yeah, like congrats on being the Johnsons. That's all I wanted to see. <laughs> Oh yeah, I feel like folks like yourself and Northern anglers, there's something special about being from the North. And I think what it is, is that's, I mean, in Texas, you bass fish all year in Florida, you bass fish all year. I think mm-hmm. that there's almost like a specialness 
And, and the reason I bring it up is because I, I think I can identify with the community that reached out to you. You know what I mean? They, there's yeah. just a group, but, but it's, I think it's almost more tight knit because we have seasons. You know what I mean? Like right. yeah. in the way that even if you're a state that doesn't have shut seasons, you have seasons due to weather, you know, the lake freezes yeah. or whatever. <laughs> but I think it's all, I almost compare it to deer hunting. You know what I mean? Like if you it's talk to hunters, thing, yeah. yeah, it's the same thing. Cause they, it's such it's limited. So they are so focused mm-hmm. on it and they've got all those months where they can't do it. So it kind of bonds you guys together a little better. You, you feel the same. Yeah. It's the same thing because like when we finally get out of hibernation, basically like there's the one tournament that everybody goes to in the spring and you see the same people every year. So it's like, yeah, it's almost like this like mini family of like Wisconsin anglers that come and fish all these tournaments. And that's basically what it gets to is like a deer hunting camp. Basically that's a good, yeah, yeah, that's a good take on it. All right. So you got a few weeks off. What are you doing? Um, well, we can't go to lacrosse. <laughs> Talking to my computer. <laughs> <laughs> we can't go to lacrosse, um, which I was sad about because I just realized the cutoff was Sunday, I believe. Yeah. And then um, what what was I going to do? Oh, yeah, get all my stuff ready for Hawaii and then get all that scheduled, the places I'm going to stay in that whole deal. And then I still got a few or probably a bunch more interviews to do on here. I have a couple lined up for this week. And then uh, what else am I going to do? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll fish around here some. And then I might do like one local tournament with my buddy, depending on the schedule and how we feel about it. And then, um, yeah, just try and fish around here. Oh, we might film a TV show with the next bite, possibly. Um, up by like Beta Knock area, so that's possibly in the works. And then, yeah, by that time it'll be ready to leave. You, you guys, what you? I mean, you worked with Next Bite before this, right? Like, you, I mean, you, your dad. Yeah, my dad just, did. What he What worked. is the setup of Next Bite? It used to be, and that seems like there's a lot of people involved in it now. Is yeah. it, is that right? Yeah, there's like uh, six or seven of us now. <laughs> that are involved with the whole TV show and everything that they're doing over there. They want to expand into the bass world and all that deal. So pretty exciting times. Do you think chase is, is very jealous of you? Not to chase that owns bass, but next bite chase. Like, I mean, because I he's stuck yeah. in the walleye world. He could be, I'm not sure what he likes fishing for. <laughs> uh i i just mess with him i love him he's a great dude um yeah, but i was messed guy. with him because a lot of times and I, I don't know if he did this year but a lot of times he's one of the guys in the outboard costumes that runs at the classic <laughs> yeah. and i'm always messed with him i'm always like you you think if our guys went to the walleye championship we'd make them run around in outboard outfits <laughs> Oh God. Um, but i think you're it's great to see how both those worlds have come together yeah. and um Happy, happy shooting with those guys. And, uh, Thanks. dude, congratulations on everything. I'm, um, uh, thank you. Appreciate it's, it. It's truly awesome to see just, um, how an event and how hard work can pay off. And I, and I think that you're a direct representative of that, just a hard work ethic and, uh, down to earth. And now that you've won, one last question. Will you, will you get air conditioning on those future? future uh, like is, I don't know. We stay might, a little nicer or no? Alex is definitely going to have, if we go back there, he's definitely going to make us go back to there just because he's superstitious. I think now guaranteed. Is he really that superstitious? Like plus, you won. So uh, plus Pam, the gal that was running it, she's definitely going to want us to come back. So I had to take a picture in front of the, the sign at the campground. So not if she listens definitely... to podcasts with you bitching about the air conditioning or anything, she might not want you back. <laughs> <laughs> no, she said she was getting a new bathroom and a new kitchen too. So there's oh, wow. improvements. Yes. The, the bathroom and kitchen that Jay Shakira built. It's uh it's nice. I like it. Um, thank you for doing this, dude. I, yeah, I didn't know. Uh, I wanted to give you a little time to just, cause I could only imagine just how busy those days after when it were. Oh, yeah. um, and I do appreciate you spending a little time uh, with me. And I really appreciate you being honest because a lot of the questions I asked you are way easier just to answer, you know, the standard answer, but you're pretty yes. honest, dude. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Appreciate you having me on Dave.
All right. Hopefully I wasn't too awkward to talk to. I know you don't like talking to many people. Oh, you're good. <laughs> I'm good. All right. Good. Oh, yeah. All right. I will see you in Hawaii, Oahu, our next uh, Elite Series South stop Dakota. in a few weeks. Yeah. I got to go shoot some fishing shows myself. So if I get oh, in trouble, cool. I'll call you guys on the next bite shoot. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> take care jay thank right. you very much thank you. Yep. it's been the most awkward ending ever but that is my specialty <laughs> so there you have it folks jay secure it um i don't know if we answered the question who the heck is jay secure it but i kind of think we did he is just somebody who is absolutely obsessed with fishing I mean, you know the only time he really ever got awkward was when you're like well what what else do you do and he's like Come to think of it, there is nothing else. Um, I mean, we're talking about a man who has trouble telling you his favorite movie, but has no trouble telling you what channels on the dial polka music can be found on. Um, pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. And um, I'd say he's got a very bright, bright future. Um, so many young studs on the Bassmaster Elite Series. And uh, Jay Securet has got two more events to hold those guys off and win Rookie of the Year. Um, but, wow, I, I just I can't imagine the mind melt that he must have gone through to, to win that event, deal with all the media, then get right into ICAST. Um, and that's why I waited a couple of weeks to do this interview. So I guess that means I'm getting mature, getting more mature. I'm not champ chasing. And if you don't think I'm mature, here's living proof. Uh, just look at the episode number this is. And I didn't say anything about it. So I think that means I'm very mature. <clears throat> so um, before I screw it up, take it away, Bob Cobb. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?